A new lead for Nigel Williams now on BBC Two, investigating the art of crime fiction with the great detectives. Dulwich College, South London, an old established English public school. Not the sort of place you'd associate with crime, although I can imagine a rather English kind of murder happening here. The case of the poisoned rugby ball, perhaps. But it does boast a pupil who created the most famous hard-boiled private detective of them all. This week we investigate the strange case of Raymond Chandler, a man whose fictional hero works a territory over 5,000 miles west of Dulwich. He may have come out of Pulp Fiction, but though he walks through a world of shootouts and fistfights, he's a tough guy with literary attitude. Philip Marlowe is an artist in a town where art is the last thing on anyone's mind. Raymond Chandler wrote about tacky one-night hotels, plastic diners, and a Los Angeles that you might think he disapproved of and hated. But although he said it was a city with as much personality as a paper cup, it's pretty clear from the detail, the way he wrote about it, that secretly he was a little in love with it. It was about 11 o'clock in the morning, mid-October, with the sun not shining and a look of hard, wet rain in the clearness of the foothills. I was wearing my powder blue suit with dark blue shirt, tie, and display handkerchief. Black brogues, black wool socks with dark blue clocks on them. I was neat, clean, shaved and sober, and I didn't care who knew it. I was everything the world's best private detective ought to be. I was calling on four million dollars. The Big Sleep, undoubtedly Chandler's most famous novel, and the one that introduces Philip Marlowe, starts in a place like this, an oil millionaire's mansion in the hills above L.A. Unlike the stories of Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot, it's a tale told through the eyes of the detective. We get our first clues about Marlowe from how he describes the place. Hi. He's not a man taken in by appearances. Hi. I'm Nigel Williams. I'm with the BBC. I'm Ranger Luis Rodriguez. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, can I come in? No, sir, you may not. At this point, sir, the mansion's only used for commercial filming. Oh, uh, right. There's no public entry into the house. Uh-huh. So it's a film set, most, most, most of Yes, it's a massive film set. Right. Well, as I can't come in, <laughs> Ranger Rodriguez, it was nice to meet you. Oh, it was nice meeting you. OK. I hope you enjoy your visit. OK, we'll prowl around the outside. OK. All right, then, bye. Bye-bye. Chandler published The Big Sleep, his first novel, at 50, and it goes well beyond the traditional whodunit to raise questions both about the detective genre and society itself. Would you say that there are any sort of basic differences between the English and the American thriller? Oh, yes. The American thriller is much faster paced. We've got into a rather sort of tea and muffin school of writing here, I think. Well, the private eye is a catalyst. Yes. He doesn't exist in real life, unless you can make him seem real. Yes. He would talk endlessly about the technique of crime writing. Short sentences, active voice, not passive. But um, he only once discussed Marlowe sensibly. And that was because I said to him, why do you passionately make out in all your books that he's such a poor man? Never any money in his pocket. Terrible old motor car, terrible old banger of a motor car. And a very shabby office, if you remember, up two flights of steps and that sort of thing. And he said, well, to tell you the truth, I was trying to differentiate him from uh, Lord Watsit, the old Etonian. <laughs> 
an eyeglass and make it quite clear that he was a, an average, middle-run American citizen. Our assignment is to find out what light Marlowe and his creator Chandler shed on each other. Just how average is this taciturn guy who casts a cold eye on the rich, especially when they're paying him? The noise of the city traffic grew curiously and quickly faint, as if this were not in the city at all, but far away in a daydream land. The beams didn't move, probably hadn't moved for a year. The wells were no longer pumping. There was a pile of rusted pipe, a loading platform that sagged at one end, half a dozen empty oil drums lying in a ragged pile. There was the stagnant, oil-scummed water of an old sump iridescent in the sunlight. Chandler didn't come to Los Angeles for the movies. In fact, the motion picture industry didn't pay much attention to him until the late 40s. He came to the West Coast originally as a drifter, moving from job to job. But what made him stay here was oil. He got a position in Dabney's, a rising company growing rich on the oil boom on the West Coast. And for 12 years, he played the part of a successful oil executive. Raymond Chandler was involved in one of the most crooked and hyped up and flamboyant industries um, in, in California and had first-hand uh, dealings with a world that seems almost fantastic to us now. Chandler was very lucky. He picked a winner. The oil company he began working for struck one of the richest veins of oil in the United States. Chandler went up with the company, and as his immediate boss was found guilty of embezzlement in the rush of riches that followed the strike, Chandler was thrust into his place. So all that corruption and shenanigans in the book, it's absolutely from life. It's not just a romantic, privatised fic. It's, it's something he'd seen go on. This, the, this, is, this is the edge that Chandler has, it feels, that Chandler has over, over other writers. It is rooted in historical observation. Early on, however, he'd had to struggle. He'd had a tough childhood. Chandler's father was drunk, sometimes violent, and eventually absent. Brought up by his mother, he was a devoted, almost model son, even if he didn't follow her and her family's plans for him to be an English civil servant. He waited until after her death to marry the one real love of his life, Sissy Pascal. Chandler's mother had disapproved of the difference in their ages. Sissy was 18 years older than Chandler, and a woman of the world. I sat down on the edge of the deep, soft chair and looked at Mrs. Regan. She was worth a stare. She was trouble. She was stretched out on a modernistic chaise long with her slippers off. So I stared at her legs in the sheerest of silk stockings. They seemed to be arranged to stare at. They were visible to the knee, and one of them well beyond. The calves were beautiful, the ankles long and slim, and with enough melodic line for a tone poem. So, you're a private detective, she said. I didn't know they really existed, except in books. Why he fell in love with Sissy was because this was a woman who didn't need the constant reassurances of his love. She wasn't going to perform a theater of insecurity with him. As he said once, love is the great theme. It's the only theme. But without love, there's only death. And that detective fiction is, is, is death sort of with a happy ending. Sissy called Chandler Ramio because he was so romantic. But he was also easily bored, and he began to hit the bottle. Now in his 40s, he'd always dreamed of writing. But the reality was a humdrum executive job and hopeless affairs with secretaries and other men's wives. In 1932, the oil company fired Chandler for drunkenness. At last, he was free to write. But what was he going to write? Here's the beginning of a poem he was working on in that year. There are no countries as beautiful as the England I picture in the night hours of this bright and dismal land. And it gets even worse. It's always unfair to hold an author's mistakes against him, especially when they're unpublished. 
but Artinus is actually at the very heart of Chandler's conception of the character of Philip Marlowe. In 1933, he sold his first detective story to a pulp magazine called Black Mask. It took him five months to complete, and he rewrote it five times. It was called Blackmailers Don't Shoot, and its lead character's name was Mallory, Thomas Mallory, the author of the Mort Dartha, the key text of medieval chivalry. From the word go, Marlowe was conceived as a knight errant to go down those famous mean streets. I was rather pleased of having said that the detective story was a sonnet which had its own special rules which had to be observed and could be rather beautiful and a, a thriller but was not a sonnet it was an ode with no rules at all it could be as high or as low as you uh, my good it was low sometimes uh, as you made it what is the burden my fate is in your hand and detectives are there in the fabric of the earliest American popular culture, but usually for cheap thrills or parody. A pulp writer had to write about a million words a year in order to support a family and so there was, n there was not much sense of literature going on. Popular for years have been detective stories and mystery thrillers. But crime fiction, by presenting a story with a beginning, a middle and an end, did have a certain honesty that perhaps more highbrow culture had lost after the war. It was a warm day almost the end of March, and I stood outside the barber shop looking up at the jutting neon sign of a second floor dine and dice emporium called Florian's. A man was looking up at the sign too. He was looking up at the dusty windows with a sort of ecstatic fixity of expression, like a hunky immigrant catching his first sight of the Statue of Liberty. talks about Marlowe going down these mean streets. Do you think he had a particular area in mind? Well, I think you uh, can see that the parts of downtown are probably the same as they were in Chandler's day. The buildings are from the turn of the century through the 1930s. But I think there's a, there's a core to L.A. that's not at all glamorous. What happens here is the, the people change, but the buildings don't. The signs on the buildings change, but the kind of thing that goes on inside of them don't that neighborhood that, that is the most difficult to make human contact with is this kind of district downtown where you can see the, the type of buildings we're in. Well, I lived many years in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles had never been written about. California had been written about, uh, a book called Ramona, a lot of sentimental slop. But nobody in my time had tried to write about the Los Angeles background in any sort of realistic way. Part of uh, the tradition in Los Angeles and most American cities is that as new waves of immigration came in, they were heavily ghettoized. And South Central was a traditional black neighborhood. It's around here, isn't it, uh, where Moose Malloy and Farewell My Lovely comes down to uh, look for Velma, and Marlo meets him in one of these cheap hotels, yeah? It, it is here, and Moose Malloy is a very big white guy, and that's what inspires the famous description of him being about as inconspicuous coming down Central Avenue as a tarantula on a slice of angel food. I think Chandler's cynicism and disdain, even though they're filtered through Marlo, who's essentially an idealist, probably turned off a lot of literary critics a long time ago, when I was writing for the Pulps, I put into a story a line like, he got out of the car and walked across the sun-drenched sidewalk until the shadow of the awning over the entrance fell across his face like the touch of cool water. They took it out when they published the story. Their readers didn't appreciate this sort of thing, just held up the action. I set out to prove them wrong. The things they remembered that haunted them 
was not, for example, that a man got killed, but at the moment of his death, he was trying to pick a paperclip up off the polished surface of the desk, and it kept slipping away from him, so that there was a look of strain on his face, and his mouth was half open in a kind of tormented grin. Chandler's bodies, as they crop up in the novels, are astonishingly vivid, and, um, and did contribute to his initial rejection by uh, the critics, because they, um, they believed it was sensationalist. But when he described death, Chandler was actually writing from experience. He'd served with a Canadian regiment in the First World War and led his troops over the trenches into battle. The terrible effect of this on Chandler can't be overestimated. But the critics didn't really see how serious he was. In America, a thriller or mystery story writer, as we call him, is slightly below the salt. You can write a very lousy, long historical novel full of sex and it can be a bestseller and it can be treated respectfully. Yes. But a very good thriller writer who writes far, far better is just gets a little paragraph or so. Yes. There's no attempt to judge him as a writer. If they ever decide to put up blue plaques on the apartments, like the one behind me that Sissy and Chandler rented while he was still a struggling writer, It'll cost them a small fortune. They moved a bewildering number of times, and he was still struggling. The Big Sleep and Farewell My Lovely had not found favour, either with the critics, the public, or the motion picture industry. They didn't like the corruption and seediness that's at the heart of those two books. But corruption was precisely what Chandler wanted to talk about. Listen, Pally, the big man said seriously. You got me on a string, but it could break. Cops don't go crooked for money, not always, not even often. They get caught up in the system. They get you where they have you do what is told them or else. And the guy that sits back there in the nice big corner office with the nice suit and the nice lick of breath he thinks chewing on them seeds makes smell like violets, only it don't, he ain't giving the orders either. You get me? You know what's the matter with this country, baby? A guy can't stay honest if he wants to. That's what's the matter with this country. He gets chiseled out of his pants if he does. You gotta play the game dirty or you don't eat. Well, I think that the uh, present conditions around our city here should be brought out in the open. The uh, police force and the public officials are being paid by the public. And uh, after all, I think that instead of being behind closed doors, I think that they should come right out and let everybody know what goes on. What did you think of his portrait of the police in, say, in those early books, The Big Sleep and uh, Farewell, My Lovely? It portrayed law enforcement and city government as it was at the time. Uh, at the time, it was uh, often um, corrupt. Uh, of course, it's not now, but at the time, that's, that's what was prevalent. And uh, what was very interesting to us was uh, in all of his uh, dealings with cities, he would always talk about Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, Hollywood, all of the major cities around town, but yet he never mentioned Santa Monica. And uh, finally, after reading a number of his books, we found that he didn't mention Santa Monica because he always spoke of Bay City. Don't know exactly his reasons for changing the name, but it might have something to do with uh, fear of uh, the politics and the police at the time. Right. Chandler was writing about a police force that he knew well, partly because uh, as a drunkard he was running uh, the wrong side of the law during Prohibition. And it was about this time that Chandler's drinking, which obviously had always been illegal, became binge drinking and became uh, in fact suicidal. And he became less and less discreet. And given the two or three very vivid descriptions of ending up in police cells that appear in the novels when Marlowe ends up in such places uh, seem more than likely that Chandler himself sort of have brushed with the law. All right, you stand straight, pull your belly in, pull your chin in, keep your shoulders back, hold your head level, look straight front, turn left, turn right, 
Face front again, hold your hands out. Palms up, palms down. Pull your sleeves back. No visible scars. Hair dark brown, some gray. Eyes brown. Height six foot one half inch. Weight about 190. Name Philip Marlowe. Occupation private detective. Well, well, nice to see you, Marlowe. That's all. Next man. Down these mean streets, a man must go who is not himself mean, who is neither tarnished nor afraid. The detective in this kind of story must be such a man. He is the hero. He is everything. He must be the best man in his world and a good enough man for any world. He is a relatively poor man, or he would not be a detective at all. He is a common man, or he could not go among common people. He has a sense of character or he would not know his job. He will take no man's money dishonestly and no man's insolence without a due and dispassionate revenge. Chandler's Marlowe, a 1930s creation, didn't come out of nowhere. Just as Agatha Christie leans on Sherlock Holmes, Chandler had real respect for only one other writer. Marlowe operates in Los Angeles, but ten years earlier and a few hundred miles up the coast in San Francisco. The action was even hotter. And it was here that an American writer gave murder back to people who had a reason for committing it. The story of the American tough guy school of crime fiction really starts here in the flood building in San Francisco. In the early 1920s, it was the home of the Pinkerton Detective Agency. And a young Pinkerton operative, who we now know by the name of Dashiell Hammett, worked here. Hammett was a real tough guy. He'd been hit on the head with a brick by someone he was following and involved in real shootouts with real revolvers. But he was sick of the job and sick of the agency. He quit and taught himself to write. The character he created, Sam Spade, the hero of a book called The Maltese Falcon is the true original of Raymond Chandler's Philip Marlowe. The Pinkerton Code. Never cheat your client. Never break a law that violates your integrity stay anonymous never take physical risks unless absolutely necessary and above all be objective never become emotionally involved with a client or anyone else connected with a case the tappity tap tap and the thin bell and muffled whir of Effie Perrine's typewriting came through the closed door somewhere in a neighboring office a power driven machine vibrated dully on Spade's desk, a limp cigarette smoldered in a brass tray filled with the remains of limp cigarettes. Ragged gray flakes of cigarette ash dotted the yellow top of the desk and the green blotter and the papers that were there. A buff curtain window, eight or ten inches open, let in from the court a current of air faintly scented with ammonia. The ashes on the desk twitched and crawled in the current. Hasn't changed since Hammett worked here. You can just Imagine Sam Spade, or indeed Marlowe, sitting behind a desk in there, a bottle of rye whiskey in the drawer, trying to swat a blue bottle as he waits for the clients that never seem to show up. Both Chandler and Hammett deal with the reality of what a detective's life is like. They're not armchair experts, cryptographers. They're out there in the real world, doing it, waiting for someone to come in and pay them $25 a day. We get hired by clients uh, to solve problems, um, not to find the truth, uh, and not to solve the ills of society or uh, not always to right injustices. Uh, one of the things we used to do a lot of was, uh, they called it child recovery, but really it was kidnapping kids in the employ of one parent seeking to get even with another parent, is what it amounts to. There were no laws that governed this. And um, the rich regularly paid to have their kids snatched from each other. Uh -huh.
Detective work is often ridiculous. An operative I knew was looking for pickpockets at the Havre de Grace racetrack and had his wallet lifted. I was once falsely accused of perjury and had to perjure myself to escape arrest. Then there was the police chief in the south who gave me a detailed description of a suspect, complete even to the mole on his neck, but neglected to mention that the man had only one arm. You learn not to put yourself into situations that'll turn violent. Um, so it's been a long time since anybody hit me over the head. Um, but it has happened. It has happened. Wow. Well, um, you were young at the time. You younger, were. and they were always older women. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm not making that up. Uh, because, of course, what's the last thing you think is going to happen when you're talking to a gray-haired gray woman in her home? You don't think she's going to hit you over the head the first moment you turn your back, <laughs> but it has happened. And then what are you going to do? What I remember is him letting us feel the bump in his head, the dent in his head that he'd gotten um, trailing somebody, rather probably very unsatisfactorily, and uh, this guy leaped out from a, behind a brick, a brick wall and beamed him. And then also he had in the palm of his, I think it was his left hand, um, a knife tip that had broken off. It was just a little blue tip in there. And so we thought that was terribly romantic. <laughs> Hammett, too, started out writing for Black Mask, low-key stories about an overweight private eye called the Continental Op. Like the Maltese Falcon, they're absolutely rooted in the city of San Francisco. Come on, Bill, hi. Hi, Nigel. Now, tell me, are you the Dashiell Hammett Society? I don't know. We're more of the Hammett cult. The Hammett cult. Behind us, this is the Stockton Tunnel, yeah? Right, yeah, we're in under us. Us, yeah. yeah, literally. In now, now, that's got real important role for Hammett fans. It's a bit like, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes and Baskerville Towers, isn't it? It's oh, yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is kind of the, the most famous spot for the Maltese Falcon because this is where the first murder occurs. Um, uh, Sam Spade is uh, dropped off at 2 in the morning. A yellow cab drops him off over here. And he comes and he pauses for a minute against the coping of the Stockton Tunnel here. It's damp with a night fog. He looks over, you see these buildings? In those days, there's just a dirt lot pitching steeply downhill to the level ground up here down to the sidewalk. And somewhere in that dirt lot, the body of his partner, Miles Archer. famous literary plaques in the, the nation, in the world. Sam Spade is standing here in the alley. They ask him if he wants to go down and take a look at the body. He says, no, you've already seen him. He's dead. I'll take your word for it. He's not really very nice, is he? Sam? No, he, Sam is not a nice guy. Well, you have to remember, Hammett was a real detective. And that's where he gets his hard edge that's genuine. That's why his hard edge is genuine, not the made-up fake hard boil that most mystery writers seem to portray or attempt to portray. It's unlike a lot of meddling that people do. It's meddling where you know there will be consequences. And, um, and you have to be clear about that. You will do things that will wreck people's lives. How do you rate Philip Marlowe as against Sam Spade? Is he tough enough, Philip Marlowe? He's fictional. He's, he's, he's uh, Chandler walks in Hammett's footsteps. He writes well, and he writes great spoken lines, but he doesn't have the natural hard edge. He's doing it from research as opposed to having actually been there. Yes, I, I read some. Also, he's not very interested in money, Marlo, is he? Where Sam, Sam would never work, he'd never work a case and not, not get the dough. I mean, oh, no, that, no that's... real detective <laughs> ever would. Yeah, no real detective ever would. Now, Philip Marlowe, by comparison, someone will, will come into his office, whatever the case is, They'll, they'll talk about it, they'll give him a retainer fee, he starts working on the case. And Philip Marlowe discovers that his clients have lied to him about something. Philip Marlowe's feelings are hurt. Philip Marlowe returns the retainer fee, and this is the good part, he goes on and solves the crime for free. Okay, that's totally preposterous. It's true that people often see things differently. 
and it's uh, one of the maxims of my business that if everyone tells the same story about an event, then they've all gotten together and decided to lie about it. <laughs> Hammett's fictional clients always lie. The detective expects them to lie. In fact, in the novel, he says, well, we didn't believe you anyway, so your, li your lie didn't count. And what counted was your $200. One of the messages for a detective, the Maltese Falcon, is that uh, you should never trust a client. And um, as a, uh, an everyday working rule, that's not bad advice. And the way you stay honest is to not impose your judgments to create a different ending. Um, does that make sense? It does. It almost sounds like writing, actually. Well, that's a similar process. The only reality the English detection writers knew was the conversational accent of Surbiton and Bogner Regis. If they wrote about dukes and Venetian vases, they knew no more about them out of their own experience than the well-heeled Hollywood character knows about the French modernists that hang in his Bel Air chateau. Hammett took murder out of the Venetian vase and dropped it into the alley. He had style, but his audience didn't know it because it was in a language not supposed to be capable of such refinements. They thought they were getting a good, meaty melodrama written in the kind of lingo they imagined they spoke themselves. It was, in a sense but it was much more. He was spare, frugal, hard-boiled, but he did over and over again what only the best writers can ever do at all. He wrote scenes that seemed never to have been written before. I know he was very, very uh, moved by uh, Chandler's um, tribute to him in The Simple Art of Murder. My father was not a saver. He hardly saved anything. That was one of the few things among his things I found was a typed manuscript, a typed copy of The Simple Art of Murder. And I think in his own, I think he typed it himself, which was very unusual for him to have done and to say, and to have kept it. Dashiell Hammett contracted TB whilst in the army and was forced to leave his wife and daughter for fear of infecting them. He moved to a small flat near the middle of the city. It was here that Hammett wrote his masterpiece, The Maltese Falcon, a story of blackmail, betrayal, and a priceless antique. I was in desperate need of a place to live and happened to be going by in a taxi and saw the for rent sign. So I inquired by telephone and it was the first unit they showed me. And it's pretty important for, for, for a Hammett fan, isn't it? Because this is the room he, he lived here, right? Both Sams lived here, Samuel Dashiell Hammett and Sam Spade. There are things over on the on the table. There's some. Um, there's an alarm clock, which I notice doesn't work. Yes, that's a very special gift from Joe Marshall, Hammett's daughter. Uh, it had belonged to him, and she gave it to me after visiting the place. Sent it in the mail. What else is there that ties this into being Sam Spade's apartment? Well, the Murphy bed. The Murphy bed was invented in San Francisco, and this one relates specifically to the novel and explains how Spade's bedroom becomes a living room. In his bedroom that was a living room, now the wall bed was up. Spade took So now it's a bedroom. And the £300 movie star, Fatty Arbuckle, by the way, charged with the gory murder of an actress, was one of Hammett's first surveillance jobs. The whole thing was a frame-up, said Hammett. In English detective fiction, murder is the really big crime. This is like the crux of the whole thing with Agatha Christie. And it could just be one murder per book. You could have maybe two murders per book but you aren't going to get into like wholesale slaughter. Whereas the climate of violence that's the backdrop for the hard-boiled detective story goes from this pioneer spirit to the cowboy. And now the cowboy is the detective. Did, did you got a gun? Oh yeah, I've got a gun. This is a gun. These are bullets. And this, if you're handing a gun to somebody, is how you do it. Empty with no bullets in it. That way they can't shoot you. 
the American private eye is an avenging figure in a way that the European detective simply isn't. Unlike Hercule Poirot, he dispenses justice physically, often from the barrel of a gun. Hi, I'm, I'm looking to rent or hire a Colt 38 or a Smith & Wesson, something uh, the kind of, say, private eye of the 1930s were used. That, that would be a 1930s gun, yeah? Yeah, approximately, in that era. Well, revolvers have been around since the early 1900s, and I'm sure, sure. it was something like this that he used. Okay. Basically, when you hold it, you want your fingers over your fingers, your thumb over your thumb. Okay, none of this like you see sometimes on TV or... Right. Okay. Lane number eight. Chandler famously said that when he got stuck on plot, he'd just have a guy walk in with a gun. But this belies the true seriousness with which both Chandler and Harry regarded their art. Their ambitions went well beyond the limits of their gun-toting, chisel-jawed heroes. I'm no longer a virgin. I'm facing away, so maybe we shot him in the back. Uh, there's a great quote, uh, actually written in this apartment in 1928, and he says, I have this long speech I sometimes go into about how someday someone is going to take the mystery story and make literature out of it. He said, I won't bore you with it now, but I have my hopes that I'll be the first. One time, I was about nine years old, and my dad was at the house. I think he'd been drinking. He says, read to me, read to me something. So I happened to have an Agatha Christie Poirot there, and I picked it up, and I started reading. <laughs> I went all over. He says, find something else for you. <laughs> that was the end of that. <laughs> so I think I picked up the Steinbeck, and that was OK. Apparently, they considered him like a modern primitive, like Grandma Moses, the painter, who just somehow did it and was great at it. And they had no clue about how intelligent he was and how widely read. And all of this stuff contributed to the background of the, the books. He said one of the uh, major influences for the Maltese Falcon was Henry James's novel, Wings of the Dove. He was a very um, original, non-traditional, unorthodox thinker in everything. I mean, just because you read it in a book or somebody told it to you, you know. He had very little. Um, you know, I don't want to say respect, but he had um, was not impressed by uh, by letters after your name. While their writing meets at so many points, as far as we know, Hammett and Chandler only met once at a commemorative Black Mask dinner. They're two different creatures, and I was thinking that um, we're interested in Marvel because of what he tells us about himself and how he sees the world and that, those great similes and everything. But Spade we're interested in because of what he doesn't tell us about himself. Hammett and Chandler were both eventually discovered by Hollywood. But by the time they got there, they were finding it increasingly hard to sustain the worlds and the heroes they had invented. Chandler's break into the movies came with the screenplay for the James Cain novel, Double Indemnity. But even though he wrote a surprising number of film noir classics, he was always an outsider. Hammett, on the other hand, faced a Hollywood nightmare. A man of the left, he was a natural target for the McCarthyite witch hunt. Well, it was a terrible time in Hollywood. Um, people's careers were, were ruined, you know, their lives were ruined. Um, my mother was, uh, when he went to prison, my mother was just really distraught. I think more, I was, what was I? I was too young to really know how how hard it would be on him, and he always put put on this tough guy front. Oh well, you know, I've been here before, like going home, um, no big deal. But it was terribly hard on him. It was hard on my hard on my mother. I think she she knew um, how um, bad his physical condition could get. And I think she she understood um, more than I did. Yes, because he was not a well man when he went to prison. No. He was taking a risk. But also his, his composure and his dignity in front of those people was... That's the way he was. The similarities between Chandler and Hammett's careers are quite extraordinary. They both hated their fathers. They both had 
major writing blocks. Both started out wanting to be poets, and both wound up writing detective fiction, initially for the same magazine. Each one immortalised a different West Coast city, and of course Humphrey Bogart played their most famous creation, Sam Spade and Philip Marlowe, for the screen. But perhaps most importantly of all, they were both drunks. This was Dashiell Hammett's favourite drink, a large vodka martini with a twist. And he drank a lot of it. The American detective story may look as if it's about tough guys with guns chasing beautiful blondes, but actually it takes its inspiration from one of the great serious writers of the 20th century, Ernest Hemingway. And like Ernest Hemingway, Hammett and Chandler are really about loneliness and loss and despair. Hammett died broke and poor. Chandler, ironically, did rather well out of the materialistic Southern Californian society his hero looks at so moodily. He settled down in a clean town with a view of the ocean. Raymond Chandler said of the view from this window, a radio writer came down to see us, looked at it and cried it was so beautiful. We said, what the hell, we live here. Raymond Chandler bought this house in 1946 for $40,000. It was the only house he'd ever really owned. It's in La Jolla, a town about 100 miles south of LA. Quiet, clean, suburban, all of those things Chandler affected to despise, but actually really rather liked. I don't think Raymond Chandler was ever really happy, but here at La Jolla, he was, let's say, relatively happy. Every wedding anniversary, he'd fill the house with flowers. There was tea at four o'clock in the English manner, and at last, he managed to settle to something like a regular writing routine. I think Chandler felt about his fiction much in the way Marlowe felt about his detective work. That Marlowe goes about his detective work determined to get to the bottom of it and satisfy his client, but uh, he's not particularly proud of it, his work. And uh, Chandler, to be honest, wasn't particularly proud of being a writer. It was something. It was what he did. He um, he had a. He was certainly proud of moments of it. He said City didn't like his his Marlowe books, and uh, Sissy was always, Sissy's opinion was always paramount to him. Uh, he was aware that there were flourishes of brilliance, but uh, there were flourishes coming from a, a mind that he sometimes felt could have been used in better ways. One thing he would not talk about, I found, was his own character of uh, Marlowe. He didn't like talking about Marlowe. He said, uh, there's been too much damn talk about Marlowe. Uh, they've gone into his character at great depth and they've practically psychoanalyzed him out of existence. The bar was pretty empty. There was a sad fellow over on a bar stool talking to the bartender who was polishing a glass and listening with that plastic smile that people wear when they're trying not to scream. The customer was middle-aged handsomely dressed and drunk. He wanted to talk and he couldn't have stopped even if he hadn't really wanted to talk. He was polite and friendly and when I heard him he didn't seem to slur his words much. But you knew that he got up on the bottle and only let go of it when he fell asleep at night. He'd be like that for the rest of his life and that was what his life was. You would never know how he got that way because even if he told you it would not be the truth. At the very best, a distorted memory of the truth as he knew it. There's a sad man like that in every quiet bar in the world. This is the old 
L.A. Jail. In The Long Goodbye, Chandler's sixth novel, Marlowe spends the night here. He's flung into solitary after being booked on suspicion of murder. The Long Goodbye took four years to write, partly because Chandler was drinking so heavily while he was working on it that his publishers thought they'd never get another book out of him. It's about a drunk called Terry Lennox, whom Marlowe meets and befriends. There's another drunk called Roger Wade, who's a popular novelist. And if we count Marlowe, that makes three drunks. Add the author, that makes four. Sissy, who Chandler called the beat of his heart, was by now seriously ill with chronic bronchitis. Together, they suffered her long and gradual deterioration. This isn't a real jail anymore, it's a film set. And The Long Goodbye isn't really a hard-boiled novel at all. It's curiously elegiac, almost soft-boiled in tone. Chandler was actually a lot closer to the world of Agatha Christie than he might have cared to admit. His unique achievement as a writer was to marry English gentility and literariness to the American tough guy school of detective fiction. When you met him, did he strike you as being an Englishman or an American? More English than American. After all, he spent four years in at an English public school. Didn't he? he reminded me very much of my own father, actually. He certainly wasn't a typical wisecracking, tough American. No, no, 60% English, 40% American. If you sort of... Uh planning any kind of a new book now? I mean, we've got this one coming out today. Well, I got myself in a bad spot now. In what way? The fellow has to get married. If he is, Marla's going to get married, is he? Yes, but it's going to be an awful struggle. So she's not going to like him sticking to his rather seedy profession, as she'd consider it. Yeah. And he is not at all going to like the way she wants to live. In a, an expensive house in Palm Springs with a lot of freeloaders coming in all the time. So it's going to be a struggle. My aunt and her divorce, I don't know. Oh, golly. You wouldn't like to go and kill her off, perhaps? Kill her? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh. It's too nice. Sissy died in 1954. To all intents and purposes, Chandler's life was over. Chandler sold the house in La Jolla in 1955. From then until his death in 1959, there was very little, apart from some very serious drinking. He wrote one last novel, Playback, that starts downtown LA at Union Station and doesn't really go very far after that. He's buried just down the coast at Mount Hope Cemetery. Only 17 people were present at the service. It's a sad life, whichever way you look at it. Death, as Chandler said, the only thing in the world no man ever has to do twice. He may have started out as a second-rate poet, but he ended up a real one. Like Hammett, we remember him not for the convolution of his plots, but for the exquisite nature of his style. The perfect mystery cannot be written. It is a form which has never really been licked. It's still fluid, still putting out shoots in all directions. Nobody knows exactly what makes it tick. But show me a man or a woman who cannot stand mysteries, and I will show you a fool, a clever fool, perhaps, but a fool just the same.